Hi, and welcome to the fourth installment of the MG Chemicals webinar series. Today we're going to be looking at adhesives and bonding solutions, and in particular we're going to focus more on the epoxy-based solutions. So with that, let's get started. All right, so on today's agenda, first we're going to look at adhesive fundamentals. We're going to look at the interactions between the surface itself and the adhesive and how they sort of work together in terms of forming that ideal bond that holds together. From there, we're going to be discussing our adhesive solution. So we're going to start with just the general bonding type adhesives. And from there, we're going to move into the more specialty type adhesives. So that's the thermally conductive, electrically conductive. And within that, we have the one part products. So I'm going to dedicate a section here to just look at the one part adhesives. And then finally, we're going to look at the dispensing accessories that work in conjunction with some of these products. All right, so let's start with adhesive fundamentals. All right, so let's just look at the surface itself. And for here, we've tried to illustrate a very smooth surface. So for that, we say that the surface energy is very low. It's, it's a very smooth surface. If something were to sit on it, it would easily just sort of roll off. And a good way to think about this is if you had to, say, scale a wall vertically. Now, if that wall is completely flat and there's nothing to hold, there's nothing really to stick, help you stick to, it's a really difficult wall to climb up. What you need are imperfections. You need grooves, you need protrusions, things to hold on so that you can stick to the wall and propel yourself up. And that's really the same when you're looking at adhesion along a surface. So what we want to do is we want to take that low energy surface and increase it. And one of the easiest ways to do that is mechanically. So with a lot of people, they will sand a surface before they will paint it. And all you're doing basically is introducing these kinds of imperfections, surface roughness at the surface so that things can hold on to there more strongly. So sanding is one approach to this. Another way to do this is to do so chemically. So with that, we have to consider the type of substrate we're dealing with. If we have, say, a plastic surface, then what we'd want to use is a more aggressive organic solvent, something like acetone, MEK, or even methylene chloride. And what that basically does is that reacts with the plastic itself and starts to mechanically meld and introduce these new imperfections that are needed for adhesion. With a metallic surface, we'd want to use an acid and that has the same effect. It basically starts to attack and you get sort of these new pits and imperfections that form along the surface to help with adhesion. All right, so now let's look at the adhesive itself by evaluating what's known as the surface tension. <clears throat> the example up top is a liquid with high surface tension. So the liquid beads up as this is the most stable structure, whereas low surface tension liquids like what we see on the bottom, can wet over a surface. So <clears throat> what we say is that when you have relatively high surface energy that is much larger than the surface tension, you see what's on the bottom in that the adhesive will wet out and you tend to get better adhesion. Whereas with the example up top, when you have relatively low surface energy, compared to the surface tension, then you see this, this beading example where you have poor wetting and relatively poor adhesion. So you need to sort of consider both factors there when you're dealing with trying to get the best adhesion possible. Next, let's look at what happens at the actual interface of the substrate and adhesive. What kind of bonding mechanisms are in place? So if we can introduce a partial charge onto the surface, which you can do with some of the more advanced techniques like corona arc and plasma type of treatments. Then if you have a partial charge of the opposite polarity within the adhesive, you can get an ionic bond and that will hold that adhesive to the surface. The other type mainly is a type known as covalent bonding, which is actual a chemical interaction where loosely bound electrons sort of form a new bond. And so that's basically what's holding the adhesive to the surface. And last thing I wanna look at when dealing with fundamentals is the type of break when we're dealing with evaluating 
adhesive performance and adhesive strength. So in the last webinar, we talked about the lap shear test where we overlap two substrate types and we hold it with an adhesive. We pull it apart and then we evaluate the strength or relatively how difficult it was to pull those two coupons apart. But we also want to classify the type of failure. So on the left here, we have what's known as an adhesive failure. An adhesive failure is basically when the adhesive breaks apart cleanly from the substrate. So if we did a lap shear test, what we would see on one coupon, we would see the adhes adhesive itself. And on the opposite coupon, we would see that it's, it's broken clean from the substrate. So we would actually see the bare substrate in classifying an adhesive failure. Cohesive failure is when the adhesive starts to break apart from itself. So if we look at that same lap shear test, what we would see is that on both coupons, you would see that adhesive because in fact, the bond between the adhesive and the substrate held, it was the bond that holds the adhesive together with its, within itself that actually failed when we did the test. So those are some of the fundamentals to consider just for evaluating how bonding is actually done some of the surface preparation techniques that are needed to promote better adhesion and some of the evaluation that we do. Okay, so from that, we're gonna now move on to the general bonding adhesives. And then as the name would imply, these are mainly just for strong bonding and providing a good hold onto a surface. So we start with the 9200 pictured on the far left. Now notice the packaging in the foreground, we have the 25 ml dual cartridge. So that comes with a plunger and you can attach these mixing tips. So when you attach a mixing tip to a cartridge, essentially what you have is almost like a one part system. There is no measuring, no mixing that is typically required with an epoxy. Here, the mixing tip does all of that. Everything is pre-measured. So you simply have to dispense onto your substrate and let it react. So the 9200 is our strongest bonding adhesive. So for difficult to bond substrates, we recommend the 9200. And basically that's its main feature is it's just exceptionally strong. It's a structural adhesive that is used, employed for a lot of uh, bonding of joints and things like that, load bearing joints. To the right is the 92FR. So this is the flame retardant version of the 9200. So with this, we've simply taken the 9200 as the base material and added flame retardant filler so that we achieve the UL94V0 recognition. And we covered that standard in the, in the second webinar when we looked at conformal coatings. That just means this flame retardant is self-extinguishing if it were to catch fire. And again, the same type of packaging. So really it, it focuses, it behaves much like a one part system. In the background, you see the 50 ml cartridge. And so for that, we have dispensing guns that you would simply attach, put on the mixing nozzle and dispense it that way. To the right of that, we have the 8332. And this is simply the fast set epoxy adhesive. So it, it's very strong bonding, used largely for quick repairs. So it sets in about five to 10 minutes. And that's its main feature. And then finally, on the far right, we have the 9310. And the 9310 is a one part system. So with that, you sort of circumvent all the issues with mixing, measuring, that sort of thing. Not terribly relevant here, because again, based on the packaging, we don't really have to do that. But with some of our other products, it becomes an issue where someone might prefer a one part system as opposed to a two part with all the measuring and all the considerations you have to do with a two-part system. I've dedicated a section here to look exclusively at just the one-part systems and how they differ and some of the considerations as well. Okay, so that's the general bonding. Now we're gonna move into the more specialized adhesive. So we're gonna start with the thermally conductive. Okay, so with the thermally conductive, the main feature here is what we want to do is bond heat sinks, which help conduit heat away from circuits onto heat generating components. Now circuits themselves have become much more densely populated, specialized, they output a lot more energy. And so with that, they tend to heat up 
a lot. So one of the main design considerations now is thermal management. We need to be able to conduit that heat away from the circuit so it doesn't overheat itself. And the way that you do that is you place these heat sinks throughout the circuit. But what the function of the thermally conductive adhesive is, is to displace the air that is at that interface between the CPU, which is generating that heat, and the heat sink itself. If you just sit the heat, heat sink onto the CPU, you still have air gaps and air pockets. So that thermally conductive adhesive layer helps to better conduit that heat from the heat generating CPUs to the heat sink, which then conduits it out of the surface. So that's its main consideration. Now, these products are not electrically conductive, but they are thermally conductive. So basically that means they move heat, but they do not move electricity. And that's gonna become important when we look at the electrically conductive adhesives. So how do you choose these things? Well, you might start with the consistency. So we have two basic types of considerations when we wanna classify something in terms of consistency. We have flowable, and that would be a semi-liquid that is able to self-level. So this would be ideal if you're mounting a horizontal type of surface. You can dispense it and it will simply level out by itself. Whereas the other one, paste, is more of a non-sagging type of material that you could apply onto a vertical surface and it's not going to drip or, or sag. So that's, that's typically what people choose a paste. So if we wanted something that's flowable, the next thing we want to consider is what's known as the working time. And we covered the working time in the third webinar. Working time is basically the time from when a system is first mixed together and starts to react to when it's no longer workable. So when you think about an adhesive and being workable, what that really means is it has to be able to spread. So it has to be low enough in viscosity that you could still spread it over a surface. Whereas if it's reacted too much and sort of stiffens that it can no longer be spread, we say the working time has expired. So here we have basically three subsets of working time, a fast, four minutes, medium, which I find most people tend to go with medium because it sort of balances the sort of extremes and the fast and the slow. And then with slow, people might take a slow cure if they have a particularly high volume, so they have to mix a large batch and they don't wanna be racing against the clock to try and get everything bonded in place in a short amount of time. So they might choose a slow cure type system. So this is the 8329TFF, the 8349TFM, and then the 8329TFS. So you notice the last letter on those product codes, F for fast, M for medium, S for slow. And that's the flowable type adhesives. And then conversely, on the other side, when we're dealing with paste, it's the exact same thing. We have paste consistency, but again, they subdivided in terms of the working time, fast, medium, and slow. And just to look at the packages, up top is the flowable adhesive. So you'll notice they're in cartridges much like the general bonding. On the bottom there, you'll see that the last two, the 8329TCM and the 8329TCS are not available in cartridges. And that's because they those materials are simply too thick to push through a cartridge type system. So they have to be measured and mix together as you would with most traditional epoxy based systems. Okay, so that is the thermally conductive adhesives. Now we're going to move to the electrically conductive adhesives. Okay, so the animation's a bit quick here and I won't be able to keep pace, but basically what we're seeing here is considerations of when you would use an electrically conductive adhesive. So in the first example, we showed soldering. Now, soldering can have limitations in terms of when you can do it. Some boards, they may not be able to handle the heat of typical solder. So in lieu of that, we have these electrically conductive adhesives, which can function as cold soldering. So you simply apply the adhesive onto the solder joint and you can room temperature cure it, or you can cure it at an elevated temperature that's still considerably lower than a soldering iron. So that's one of its main features. The, the other one is you can actually use it to draw electrical traces. So that could either be for repairing traces where something's been damaged and instead of getting a whole new circuit, you just apply this 
adhesive to it and repair the circuit that way. Or you can use it if you need to actually bridge two neighboring components together by forming that electrical connection. And then the next application we find is in stenciling. So again, with stenciling, you apply a stencil over a board, apply the adhesive, trowel it over, and then you have a new stencil with this, again, electrical traces. So that's that tends to be doable with some of the products that are soft enough and have a long enough working time, you can do that. Less so than with the other two examples I mentioned in that it's done for cold soldering or electrical replace and repair. Okay, the, this is a bit of an aside, but I felt it was important to cover here. And that is the concept of how do we evaluate the electrically conductive adhesives in terms of their main function, which is electrical conductivity. And I think a lot of people get pulled away in tangents and don't think about it in the right context. So they'll call me and they'll say, well, I'm trying to measure the surface resistance and I'm not getting the right values. And that's because it's variable. So it's, it's not actually a test that you can take in terms of absolutes. And so we, we stopped actually reporting the surface resistance on our technical data sheets and we simply report resistivity. And I wanna try and illustrate the difference between those two properties. So I started with basically a room and the room contains furniture. Now let's say we have a ball and the objective is to move the ball from one side of the room to the other without hitting anything. So the ball has to avoid the furniture. And so to do that, it's got to go sort of up and over, but it has a lot of different potential paths. Okay. But now what happens if we were to lower the room? Well, what that does is that takes away some of the degrees of freedom or some of the available paths for that ball to get to the other side. So that is much the same as with surface resistance. Surface resistance is measured in ohms per square. And what you see is that it varies depending on how thick of adhesive you apply onto an area. The thicker you make it, the the more conductive it is. And that's because like with this example, it's almost the opposite of what we've done. It would be like taking that roof and making it higher and higher. So that ball has more degrees of freedom to move around. Whereas the resistivity is more about the amount of furniture in the room. That furniture is what is impeding the path of the ball to get from one side to the other. So regardless of how you change the dimensions of the room, the furniture itself does not change. And that's kind of the correct way to think about the conductivity. It's, it's looking at the resistivity and not the surface resistance. So that's kind of the point that I wanted to make and that changing the dimensions of the room does not change the obstacles, the amount of obstacles, the state of the obstacles, which here I've illustrated as the furniture. But instead what it does is it limits how much the degrees of freedom that ball can move around <clears throat> in order to reach the opposite wall. Whereas the makeup of the room is sort of synonymous with the resistivity. And that's where we always try and bring people back to is the resistivity is the best way to compare whether a material is more conductive than the other. It's not surface resistance. So again, that's more synonymous with surface resistance when you change the dimensions of the room. <clears throat> All right, so I can't do a simple flow chart here when we're talking about electrically conductive adhesives because what I find is that it's more about trade-offs. So with trade-offs, you really have to go to the customer and say, well, if you want this, then you're getting that. And it really is almost a balancing act. So if we think about things that are more or less favorable, things we can consider in terms of, okay, cost versus conductivity, well, how does that affect it? The more conductive something is, the more silver particles that are in the adhesive. And subsequently, that is what's driving the cost of these materials. So basically, if you want something that's more conductive, you are going to pay for it. <clears throat> if you're talking about adhesion, it's actually the opposite effect. 
So when you have less silver particles, you actually have more available polymer functional sites to bond. So you tend to get better adhesion with the lower filled adhesives. And then the last parameter is the working time. But again, that's not necessarily a trade-off thing. That more works in terms of what the individual customer's process is. Do they want to be able to room temperature cure it? Then they would need a shorter working time type of adhesive. Whereas if they had a larger volume, a, a longer working time adhesive might be more beneficial because again, a short term might expire by the time they get to it. And you really don't want to waste these materials given the cost. So again, that's not necessarily a trade-off. It's just more what's a better fit. So looking at the packaging, again, these do not come in a cartridge. They're simply too thick to dispense through. So we sort of, I've sort of sectioned them off here. On the left is the 10 minute working time. So these will cure at room temperature. That's the 8330 and the 8331. In the middle, we have the 20 minute working time. These again will also cure by room temperature and that's the 8330D and the 8331D. And then finally on the right, we have the four hour working time, 8330S, 8331S. S is for slow, but these do not cure entirely at room temperature. You do need to heat cure them. And again, if you're looking at minimum temperature, we could probably get away with as low as about 50 degrees Celsius to initiate that final the gear. They will reach a state of cure at room temperature, but not fully cured. So you do have to add heat to sort of post cure and reach that final cured state. So again, how do we think about choosing these? Well, do we want room temperature? Or do we want elevated temperature cure? And again, that kind of circles back to the idea of working time. And then from there, we just want to look at conductivity. Do we want something that's high? And that's the 8331 series or more extreme, the 8330. So again, you're, you're trading off cost and you're trading off adhesion when you're dealing with conductivity. So that's for room temperature cure. And then for elevated cure, we have the same thing, high and extreme conductivity. So the 8331S for high and the 8330S for extreme. Okay, so that covers the specialized adhesives. Now I wanna sort of circle back to the one part adhesives. And these are within all of the other adhesive subcategories, but I wanna sort of go back and dedicate a section here just to the one parts to show how they're a bit different and how they work. Okay, so if we look at a traditional two part epoxy system, what we have is epoxy resin, and added to that is an amine. You can also add different groups like an amide. You can add a mercaptal type. And basically that's a, an acid base type of reaction. I didn't, I didn't show the structure of an epoxy. I just simplified it as you get cured epoxy when you add these two components together. Now, how does that differ from a one part system? Well, in one part system, what you basically have is the same thing, an epoxy resin, but then you have this, so, that's meant to show that everything is mixed together, but what's stabilizing it is this blocking group, okay? When we look at the blocking group, what happens is when we add heat, we basically thermally degrade the blocking group. So once that's removed, it's essentially reacting like a traditional two-part system does, where the blocking group no longer is there to inhibit the reaction. So we have, again, that fundamental acid base. So the important thing to consider here is that we have to reach a minimum threshold temperature to activate these types of compounds. At room temperature, they're, they're stable and they will not react. So if the process can handle elevated cure, then one parts may be a very ideal solution because they don't have the steps required like measuring, mixing, which not only is more convenient, but it, it should reduce the amount of error because then the operator isn't beholden to sort of be able to do these things. They can simply dispense the material, heat it, and get the cured product. 
Now again, if we go back to trade-offs, what do we trade off here? Well, if we get something that's more convenient, we're sort of limiting our cure options because again, we can't cure at room temperature. And typically we see, I think our lowest curing adhesive is 70 degrees Celsius. So meaning that, you know, you can't cure anything below 70 degrees Celsius, which may be a consideration depending on the type of electronics or substrate that you have. So that's that's the main thing we need to consider when we're looking at a two-part system is we don't have that kind of freedom with cure schedules as we do with most two parts. We look at the different packaging sizes available for the one parts. We start with the 9310. I already introduced that way back at the beginning of this webinar, but just to circle back, the 9310 is a general bonding one part epoxy adhesive. We have two electrically conductive one part adhesives, the 9400, and that's the lower glass transition. The lower glass transition is indicative also of the lower minimum cure temperature. So the 9400 requires temperatures of 70 degrees or higher to initiate cure, whereas the 9410 is a higher TG compound. So again, it's more stable at higher temperatures, whereas a lower TG is more ideal if you're dealing with something that requires a lot of thermal cycling. Okay. 9410 though, because it is a higher TG, it also requires a higher minimum cure. And I, I want to say that's 90 degrees Celsius for that particular compound. Also, the 9410 is one of the softer one parts. So when I talked about stenciling with the electrically conductive adhesive, the 9410 a lot of people will use that for stenciling. It's got a very soft, it's almost like a toothpaste type of consistency. So it spreads out and it's very easy to, to stencil on. And then finally, we have a fairly new product, 9460. And this is a thermally conductive one part adhesive. So it's available in a three and in 10 mil syringe. Last, I just wanna look at some of the dispensing accessories and this will apply to our two parts that we looked at earlier. So when looking at the different dispensing accessories, we have dispensing guns, and these are used for those two-part systems. We talked about the 50 ml cartridges. And then we see here the mixing nozzles. So again, that functions to mechanically mix the two components together so that you don't have to. And that is simply attached to the end. All right, so let's look at some of the conclusions from today. Adhesion is dictated by the compatibility and interaction of the substrate and adhesive at the substrate adhesive interface. Techniques can be done to improve adhesion of different substrates. So we talked about mechanically etching, chemically etching, or you could go to more advanced techniques, plasma to introduce that surface charge that we talked about. Okay, so for best overall bond strength, we use epoxy resins. Thermally conductive adhesives displace air at the CPU heatsink interface to give that heat a more direct path to be conduited away from the PCB. Electrically conductive adhesives are used to cold solder, bridge components, or stencil traces. Several factors such as the conductivity, adhesion, cost, and working time need to be considered when choosing the right product. And then again, we go back to that example of the ball reaching the other side of the room. And we've updated our technical data sheets accordingly. But again, I want to stress resistivity is the correct way of comparing conductivity between products. So if you want something that is the highest conductivity, you look for something that has the lowest resistivity, not surface resistance. And then finally, one part adhesives are ideal materials for higher throughput and better precision because, again, we don't need to measure a mix, but you have limiting curing options. Okay, so that concludes today's presentation. Again, my name is Michael Strong and I head technical support. You can reach me at the email address listed there or at the phone number you see on the slide. We will now open the floor to any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, so that concludes the adhesive webinar and let's do what that guy says and answer some questions. So I will go to the questions panel, starting from the top.
The first question, how is the thermal conductivity of a thermal adhesive measured? Okay, so the thermal conductivity value that you will see in a technical data sheet is measured in watts per meter Kelvin. Now there are different units, but we typically find within at least North America that watts per meter Kelvin is the preferred unit of measure. And there's a couple ways to measure it, but you know, basically you're looking at how well a material is able to, it, it, it basically absorbs a lot of heat and, it, and you sort of get a measured response on how that heat profile decays. So I, I, I don't know if I want to get too much more specific on that, but you know, the rule of thumb here is the higher the value, the better. And with a lot of adhesives, we see you know, about one and a half to maybe three is the top one. The trade-off here, of course, is if you achieve a high thermal conductivity, you've got to use pretty, we'll say expensive filler materials. And that will also thicken the adhesive substantially. So how workable is the adhesive once it's mixed is, is another trade-off. So we're, we're constantly sort of researching and, and trying to achieve higher thermal conductivities. But again, it does come with that trade-off in terms of the change in, changes in consistency and cost. But it's, again, that watt per meter Kelvin that we do report on the technical data sheet. And you're looking for higher higher value is, is meaning it's, it's a better better for heat management. Okay, next question. Other than attaching heat sinks, what other, other applications are there for thermal adhesives? And I can say to that, you know, the, the main one, the main other one that I get from prospective customers is attaching thermocouples. Okay, so a thermocouple is just a device that's used to send a heat measurement. And sometimes they will have this mounted in such a way where it's got to be secured onto something, but they don't want to lose that heat flow. So they, they attach it to somewhere that maybe they'll attach it to a metal envelope, but they want something in between there so that they lose as little of that heat signal as possible. So that, that and the heat sink are the main ones that, that I typically see. Okay. Do you have any flame retardant adhesives? The answer, of course, is yes. So we see the 9200 FR is a flame retardant adhesive. As well, we have some of the thermally conductive adhesives are also flame retardant. So the 8329 TFF is registered as UL94B0. And then the 8349 TFM, we have internally validated as being flame retardant. So there are options in terms of if you need flame retardancy and if you need that UL recognition, we do have products available. Okay, moving on. Do you see any other chemistry available for adhesives? So that's a good question. We also list RTV silicones within our adhesive catalog, but that is a very expansive line. And I think that we reviewed it and thought it needs its own webinar. So we've broken that up into epoxies, which we covered today. And then we will do in the future, and it's probably going to be the next webinar, we will look exclusively at silicone RTVs. The other chemistry we are evaluating currently is UV cure. So UV cure has that same advantage that we talked about in webinar two with the 4200 UV UV conformal coating in that UV materials facilitate high throughput. And they're also very easy to use, but then they are limited in terms of the substrates you can bond because you have to have that line of sight and it has to be, you know, it has to be available to the light in order to react and bond. So that's currently under development that we will add. We used to have cyanoacrylates, but we were never really a big player in that. So we no longer carry those. Okay. What is the difference between 8331 and 8331D? Well, the biggest difference that we see is the working time. Okay, so 8331 has a 10 minute working time and the 8331D has a 20. Now there are other subtle differences you will see in terms of conductivity, adhesive strength, things like that. Consistency is more or less the same. 
So 8331D was actually inspired because of regulatory concerns. And I think moving forward, that will be the replacement of 8331 because these things are always evolving. New ingredients are being added to the hazardous ingredients list, which sort of forces us to rethink our current available products. So that's sort of what that was born from. But, you know, the, the main difference I think that people will see is that working time, not so much the cure time, but the working time. Okay, so for adhesion, which one is better, one part or two parts? And when you actually look at the data sheet, two parts seem to outperform the one parts, but I, I don't have an answer why. So that's just simply empirical that we find when we do the different lap shear testing, we find that the two parts are superior in terms of adhesion. But I, I currently don't exactly know, and I can't expand on why that is. We would have to undertake sort of an investigation in, in understanding that and whether that can sort of be, that gap could sort of be closed a little bit. But yeah, for, for maximum adhesion, a two-part system tends to be a better fit. Okay, next question. Do you still offer 8329 TFM? And if so, what is the difference between the 8329 TFM and 8349 TFM? So I actually made an error in the presentation in presenting the 8349 TFM, and I listed it as having a 45 minute working time, whereas in reality it has a 20 minute working time. And this is another product that was spawned by regulations. So sometimes they kind of catch you off guard and, and the 8329 TFM was, it, it, you know, it used to fill that place, you know, a year ago, I would have put 8329 TFM in that sort of situation or situation in that place. And yes, it does have a 45 minute working time. Now, I'm not exactly sure on the future sales of 8329 TFM. Benham, can you comment on the future availability of the 8329 TFM? Okay, so I uh, just want to make sure that you hear me well. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the question is what is the future availability of 8329 TFM? That's right, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, I think you, you, you said that uh, already, uh, 8329 a three four nine TFM will eventually uh, replace A three two nine TFM. Uh, first of all, it has a lot of advantage. A three four nine TFM is flame retardant, has a shorter working time. So if some people uh, prefer it that way, um, I would say still we're gonna have keep it in the market for another year or two uh, before we fully phase out A three two nine TFM. Okay, great. So <clears throat> there you have it. And that is all the questions that I see for now, unless there are any others. Okay, well, if you think of something later on, you could always send me an email and we can discuss it privately. But otherwise, that concludes the webinar series. We may be a bit longer than traditionally we've done one about once every month. We may delay this temporarily as we're doing a more advanced one in conjunction with momentum for the RTV silicone. So we will post the date of the next upcoming webinar once we know it. So don't be alarmed, but otherwise we will see you for the next time and thank you for your attention.